because she said that my UN stuff inspired her. I wrote you a letter. I brought it. So good to finally meet you. <laughs> it's so great to meet you. <laughs> uh, because you're an excellent, excellent crier. Thank you very much. She said that my UN stuff inspired her. I wrote you a letter. I brought it. Thank you very much. I just want to tell you both. Good luck. What celebrities and certain actors from Suits say might sound good, the courses they are paid to advocate for, the buzzwords they use to sell their courses to the public, and the empowering advice they give to people. However, can we actually trust their statements and messages? Do they take their own advice? In this video, we'll take a look at Megan's self-branding in different interviews to see what image people are supposed to associate her with. We'll compare the interviews to find out what she really says and what she really believes. Young, ambitious, advocating for the things I deeply and profoundly believed in. Like and subscribe for more videos. I promise to keep the videos organic to the values I deeply and profoundly believe in. Let's get this party started. In interviews, Megan overemphasizes her alleged deep commitment to the causes she's paid to say she advocates for. Part of her self-branding is to make people feel like this is part of who she is, and thus, authenticity is important for Megan to highlight. Like When you really follow what makes sense to you intrinsically, I think you end up on the right path. Anything I get involved with, I don't want to just show up on a red carpet for a cause and wave my hand without knowing what I'm really doing there and why it's important for me to be there. And the same to be said with UN Women, of course. The UN's an incredible organization, but I'm not just going to tack my name onto it and not really know something purpose-driven is happening for me. The presupposition in Megan's last statement is that there are celebrities who, unlike her, advocate for causes they don't know much about who enjoy the recognition more than the work. This way, by contrast, she makes what she does sound much more profound than that. This kind of implicit comparison to a less desirable group is often part of a person's self-praise. We should also note the perspective. She's part of an organization that gets millions of dollars for pathos-driven advertising about helping people. However, she says, for me, twice important for me to be there, purpose-driven is happening for me. This suggests that Megan's personal ambition is the primary motivation behind her decision-making. And from other interviews, we know how much this word, ambition, means to her. And what of yourself do you see in Rachel? Are there any qualities of yourself that you've infused into her? Well, I mean, she's a foodie now, because they knew that was very important to me. And um, But no, in terms of actual Mm -hmm. characteristics that we're both incredibly ambitious um, and I do appreciate that we're both very strong-willed and um, so I appreciate how Rachel handles that and I see a commonality with us there. In the same interview, Megan continues to make her personality and core sound deeper than the average, even though what she says is actually very general and a repetition of what other celebrities have said a million times before. Yeah, I mean, the TIG is, it, it has a lot of elements to it. There's fashion, travel, of course, There's interviews with, with Yeah, people. TIG talks that I do with a lot of celebrities or influencers. And then, you know, the beauty section, which is important to me because I've tried to redefine it and write a lot more think pieces and things that really speak to inner mm -hmm. beauty. Um, so I started it, it'll be two years in May. Seriously, Aww. using your outreach for, for good, for to connect with people. Well, you know, I feel a really big responsibility. Like, if... If you have this kind of job and you have an opportunity to have a profile where people are listening mm -hmm. to what you're saying, I really truly think you need to be saying something that's valuable. No one would disagree with this. Everyone would agree that we should say valuable things all the time. That's how we know the I adverbs really, really truly and truly have an overly persuasive function and are part of Megan's self-branding. Words like these demonstrate a high level of self-awareness, that the person speaking is concerned with people's perception of them, and in many cases more concerned with the perception, the image, than the cause itself. As all politicians know, it's important to act like you're friends with ordinary people. This results in a lot of stage moments with politicians visiting people's homes and workplaces. We also have a staged, or at least very much planned, moment in this interview, designed to highlight Megan's authenticity. Ironically enough. It's also been a great way for me to connect with people, like Emily, who's right here. 
I only know her through Twitter, and I knew she was coming because I saw it on social media. Stop it, really? Yes, and she's going on a trip soon to Costa Rica to do some aid work because she said that my UN stuff inspired her. I wrote you a letter. I brought it. Okay, that is amazing. It's so good to finally meet you. It's so great to meet you. We'll take, oh, oh, oh. This is, I got a big letter from him. Oh, no. I also have a letter from Sol, who is Meghan Markle. Expert. Oh, yeah, in Brazil. Yes. Yeah, so oh, my God. Hers, and then I'll talk to you right after. Okay. We'll finish. <laughs> <laughs> That is so cool. That's actually Isn't like sweet. Seriously, Aww. using your outreach for for good. This exchange could have easily taken place after the show, but it's important for Megan that it takes place while the cameras are rolling, because she can use it to create visual proof of how she connects with people. She can then go on to talk about it, and she does, as we were lucky enough to see in the previous clip. For to connect with people. Well, you know, I feel a really big responsibility. Like. Megan's constantly controlling people's perception of her, which is why her statements often end up sounding inauthentic, the exact opposite of her intention. So no, I'd never, I'd, I'd never watched Suits. I'd, I'd never heard of Megan before, mm -hmm. and I so. think for both of us, though, it was given that I didn't know a lot about him. Mm -hmm. For both of us, it was just a really authentic and organic way to get to know each other. The only reason for saying that it was authentic and organic is because there's doubt about it. If it were simply authentic and organic, whatever this is supposed to mean, if anything, there'd be no reason to say it. But here, as in many other places, she draws the conclusions for the audience before they start questioning her motivations or ambitions. As we see then, drawing the conclusions for people can actually end up having the opposite effect. And moments that are designed to appear authentic end up looking inauthentic. Being ambitious is one of Megan's core traits, or what she repeats the most, so much so that she projects her ambitions onto her character from Suits, Rachel. Now you guys may recognize Megan from USA's Suits. You play Rachel. Tell us a little bit about your role. Uh, Rachel is the paralegal at the firm, but she's sassy and intelligent, incredibly confident, um, has this encyclopedic knowledge of the law, and is incredibly valued at the firm. The conjunction but has a paratactic function. Paratactics means placing two things side by side, linking two sentences. This conjunction minimizes and negates that which preceded it. Here, she's using the paratexas to linguistically contrast being a paralegal to being confident and intelligent. This contrast is unexpected, as there is no contrast. You can be an intelligent and confident paralegal. Thus, this passage tells us a lot about how Megan thinks that being a paralegal isn't enough to satisfy her own ambitions. This was an example of an implicit complaint. Next, we have an example of an explicit complaint. Is that one of them swanky designer dresses? I got all dolled up for you. Well, I like I, it's really working. Oh, are you a lawyer then? No, I'm a paralegal. No, she's trying to be a lawyer, and I hope that she can be that at some point. But for now, no, the lowly paralegal. Returning to the interview with the authentic, staged moment, Megan has more to say about Rachel, suggesting that Rachel doesn't quite suit her ambitions. No pun intended, of course. I don't cry as much as Rachel does. I don't think anyone does. Oh, gosh. Um, How do you cry? Uh, because you're an excellent, excellent crier. Thank you very much. Considering many of the scenes in the heartwarming docuseries, which was also about connoting authenticity, being a fantastic crier isn't exactly a compliment. Quite the opposite. Life-changing advice is also part of the self-branding. It's so easy for us to get distracted and to lose interest, but they said, don't give it five minutes if you're not going to give it five years. It's I know advice. five years sounds like a long time. Oh my gosh. But it's really not. Which is interesting, considering that Meghan did give the royal family five minutes, but not five years. Empowerment advice sounds good, but it doesn't always mean the speaker believes it. So, you're still coming to the marathon tomorrow, right? I, uh... You what? I don't know if I have it in me. You'll do fine, 
Just think about crossing that finish line. You're right. Thanks. You're such a good friend. You're welcome. Also, there are important discrepancies between the image people are supposed to have of Megan and her inability to even describe what her work entails, specifically. So before analyzing how Megan complains about the royal family, let's look at her surface-level, rehearsed monologues. What's interesting about these monologues is that they are identical from interview to interview, no matter the question that preceded them. It's always the same focus points, the same things people are supposed to be impressed by. And I did. I took that week off work to really understand the pillars of the organization and working closely there. So I went to Rwanda um, shortly thereafter to really meet with female parliamentarians because Rwanda has the highest percentage of female parliamentarians of any government in the world. 64% of their government is female, which is astounding and amazing. This overrepresentation is supposed to amaze people. She intentionally ignores the tragic history behind it and expects the audience to ignore it too. Therefore, this is a condescending simplification of the circumstances that led to this overrepresentation and suggests that this advocacy is much more about using the right words than speaking about substance or truth. A percentage like this isn't automatically good. It needs to be contextualized. And when we know the context, words like amazing don't belong, just like they didn't belong in other interviews. It's an incredible country which has the highest percentage of female parliamentarians of any government in the world. 64% of their Congress is female, which is amazing. amazing. Yes, yeah, so last year, last February actually, I went to Rwanda, which was incredible because Rwanda has um, the highest um, percentage of female political participants of any other country in the world. So 64% of their government is female. Um, wow. So when you see 64% of... In her interview with King, however, she couldn't avoid having to admit the primary reason for this percentage, even though she tried to by stalling. With all the problems Rwanda has had, mm -hmm. how do you explain this seemingly contradiction? I think it's really, you know, truly, and especially being there on the ground, it was so interesting to see that in the wake of obviously such a horrendous experience that they had, which was not much more than 20 years ago or so, right? We're talking something that was fairly recent. Yeah. And in that, yes, A, so many of the men were lost in the genocide. It's very revealing or damaging that Megan, despite this admission, still continues to talk about it in new management terms like empowering and benchmark. So it gave women an opportunity to either succumb to that or to then find some strength and then mobilize in a way that was really empowering. And I think that's specifically what they've done, which is a great benchmark for what women all over the world could be doing. This shows us that she puts her ideology, or what she's rehearsed more like it, above this tragic history. That all that matters is what's empowering to the demographic she claims to advocate for. When people use positive words in a negative context, it's always a red flag. It's a sign of simplifying and self-serving communication or self-branding. Um, and then I was just recently in Rwanda again for something different with World Vision. That was just in January, working on um, building new wells and water sources. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's a really easy lineation. I look at it and go, many young women and young boys, but specifically young women, aren't able to go to school because they're spending hours a day walking to get water for their families. It's interesting that the demographic she doesn't advocate for is mentioned as an irrelevant side note. And young boys, but the side notes articulated with an increased speech rate combined with a fast contrast initiated by the conjunction but. Also, there's vowel stress in the conjunction and rather than the noun. Many young women and young boys, but all of this reveals that she wants to get to something else fast and that this isn't the demographic she's interested in ideologically. So by fixing that one piece of the puzzle, you can see from a grassroots level, you're going, now they can stay in school, they can get an education, they have a much larger promise for a brighter future, so. In this interview, she merely talks about a brighter future. However, the alleged end goal with this campaign changes from interview to interview. In her interview with King, she unsurprisingly repeated the same story. 
However, when we pay close attention, we notice that the campaign's end goal varies. Let's watch. And people would typically say, well, what does water have to do with women's rights? And where is the correlation there? I think what's been really interesting is it's all so interconnected. And when you look at something like that, you say, okay, well, building wells, sure, you have the water and you have the life source. But what it also does is enables young girls to not have to walk miles to get water for their family. And instead, they're able to stay in school. And that education is going to foster them being able to be very active in their society and empower female leadership. It should be noted that these are some pretty big logical leaps. But even if we accepted this thought experiment as fact and not the advertising it is, Megan makes a change in her correlation. The correlation goes from talking about rights. And people would typically say, well, what does water have to do with women's rights? And to leadership is enables young girls to not have to walk miles and empower female leadership. There's a big difference between talking about rights and leadership. Again, this lets us know that this is about advertising first and foremost, saying the right words in order to get the necessary funding and financial and emotional support from people. This is further emphasized by the fact that Meghan always uses the same stories about the parliamentarians, about the water, about the soap commercial. Now, of course, I would never play the soap commercial story in full. I know many of you have come to think of it as a horror story. But just a few excerpts to see how identical it is from situation to situation. It's like going to the dentist. It's over before you know it. I promise. This commercial came on with the tagline for this dishwashing liquid. And the tagline said, Women all over America are fighting greasy pots and pans. Two boys from my class said, yeah, that's where women belong, in the kitchen. I remember feeling shocked and angry. And the class was very small and we were watching TV and this commercial came on for a soap manufacturer, an ivory dishwashing liquid. And in the tagline of the commercial it said, women all over America are fighting greasy pots and pans. And two of the boys in my class said, yeah, that's where women belong, in the kitchen. And whatever it was in me at 11 years old, it sparked this frustration and this desire for change. Even when King presses her to detail what her work entails specifically, we get the same answers. And the answers point more to travels and photo opportunities than actual work. What does the work entail? What do you do? Yes, yeah, so last year, last February, actually, I went to Rwanda, which was incredible because Rwanda has... Um... In the AOL interview, the interviewer hints at this. But does she get a specific, personal answer? What is it like going on one of those trips? Because I feel like we see the photos, Yeah. but what is the experience actually like? There's a short pause, a transition relevance place, where Megan could have started answering, but she doesn't. What is it like going on one of those trips? Because I feel like we see the... In conversations, a short pause like this can indicate a so-called problem source, that the speaker doesn't know how to answer or doesn't want to. When Megan finally answers, she has little to say, which explains the pause. In the following, we should note her initial interjection, which indicates hesitation, and restarts, all indicating that she has trouble answering. Um, well, my trip to Rwanda last year was very different because it was just, you know, it was primarily at Parliament. I did go to a refugee camp, though, um, which was my first experience of that. And I think it's it's being there is a very different experience than what you, you see mm -hmm. on TV. Of course, it impacts you so much so that, you know, this year I was back in Rwanda. I feel very connected to that country now. Um, this expression says it all. First of all, she uses though when saying, I did go to a refugee camp though. This word indicates a contrast, but we never hear what she's contrasting. But by the hesitation and lack of details, we can deduct that she's implying that she didn't do a lot. This is further evidenced by the inclusion of did, and also the vowel stress on this verb. Secondly, she says it impacts you. Of course it impacts you so much. This impersonal pronoun points to a general rather than a personal experience. Thirdly, she talks like she doesn't know how she wants the sentences and this entire passage to end. Um, 
Well, my trip to Rwanda last year was very different because it was just, you know, it was primarily, and I think it's, it's... Which is also highlighted by her sudden use of you know, which is used in context where the speaker is very much self-aware all of a sudden, like when they don't know what to say. You know, you know, this year... She tries to correct this vague answer or non-answer by returning to general self-branding. Being in these different villages, I think, it, you know, the biggest takeaway for me, especially in, especially in my industry, is the contrast of yeah. the things that, you know, the, it just puts a different level of perspective on the things we take for granted and the things that we complain about, right? But I think there's something so anchoring about being able to have a hands-on experience. Just any opportunity to help people that have mm -hmm. less than you will change how you move in the world without question. I think everyone should do it. I'm glad Emily is. The question was about what the experience was actually like, but Megan's response is self-branding to the nth degree. Generic descriptions, rehearsed words like the new management term hands-on, and closing reference to the audience member who's there to prove Megan's outreach to ordinary people. The self-branding exposes a surface-level understanding of the cause, contrary to how profound she made her understanding seem which is probably why she had to emphasize how deep her understanding was in the first place. Once again, it doesn't sound like she knows how her sentences will end up. They're stalling. You know, the biggest takeaway for me, especially in, especially in my industry, is... After a short pause, she ends up with the word contrast. And when she can't or doesn't want to detail this contrast, she uses the adverb just, which has a simplifying function, as a way of ending this part of her response as quickly as possible. Is the contrast of yeah. the things that, you know, the, it just puts a different level of perspective on the things with right. we take for granted and the things that we complain about, right? She's asking rather than stating, underlining the uncertainty and vagueness that dominate this response as a whole. However, all of this doesn't stop Megan from repeating how invested she is. Invested in the self-branding, that is, but we aren't supposed to see that. Um, but for me, I like, I don't just want to show up somewhere and wave my hand and feel like that's enough. Mm -hmm. Like if I'm going to have my name attached to it or I'm going to do it, I really get very hands-on, um, which is exhausting, but you can sleep a lot better at night knowing that when you put your thumbprint on it, you feel really proud of being a part of it and you know that it's being done well. This is another characteristic of Megan's behavior, making short pauses in order to remember the exact words she's rehearsed. You can sleep a lot better at night knowing that when you put your thumbprint on it, you feel really Here it's the word thumbprint, which you also used here. Um, and really putting my own personal thumbprint on it. It's my handwriting on the site. I mean, the logo is designed like a wine glass with... Also, this is the second time we hear the term hands-on, a term she also used in the Royal Foundation Forum interview. And I certainly know how passionate I am, and Harry and I see the world so similarly in our approach of being very hands-on with things. Megan obviously has a script, which indicates that the self-branding part is the most important part for her to get across. She which says it's exhausting, exhausting, but we never hear what's exhausting about getting overpaid to travel to another country and meet people. Overall, Megan brands herself as a deep, strong-willed person with a profound cause, a person willing to fight for what's right. I always just stood up for what was right. Oftentimes you walk in here and it's like you're bigger than life just walking in. Is that how you felt just now? Yes, no. I mean, the, whole, the whole place lit up, absolutely. Well, that's why, well, you know. However, does this self-perception correspond to reality? In order to answer this question, let's rewatch this pivotal moment. As people say. It just puts a different level of perspective on the things we take for granted and the things that we complain about, right? So has Megan learned from this experience? What does she complain about? Surely it can't be about insignificant things, can it? I suggest we let the Oprah interview give us the answer, the real answer this time. There was no guidance as well, right? Mm -hmm. There were certain things that you couldn't do, but you know, unlike what you see in the movies, there's no class on how to 
how to speak, how to cross your legs, how to be royal. There's none of that training. That might exist for other members of the family. That was not something that was offered to me. No, no I mean, it's, no, but even down, yeah, sorry, but even down to like the national anthem, <laughs> no yeah. one thought to say, oh, you're American. You're not going to know that. That's me late at night Googling how, what's the national, I've got to learn this. I don't want to embarrass them. I need to learn these mm -hmm. 30 hymns for a church. All of this is televised. I've always wondered what she means by learning how to speak. What would such a course even look like? And would she honestly have been interested in having other people teach her how to speak? I'm not totally convinced about that. Did you make Kate cry? No. So where did that come from? Was there a situation where she might have cried or she could have no, cried? No, the no. reverse happened. And I don't say that to be disparaging to anyone because a few days before the wedding, she was upset about something. It made me cry and it really hurt my feelings. Okay. And I've forgiven her, right? Mm -hmm. Megan and Oprah haven't only rehearsed the interview beforehand, but Megan's also suggested some or most of the questions. Megan knows exactly what Oprah will ask her. So her hesitation here is an act. She's pretending to be reluctant to talk about it in order to protect Catherine. She says she doesn't want to be disparaging to anyone while being disparaging to Catherine. And she says she protected this from ever being out in the world while saying it to the world. And I don't say that to be disparaging to anyone because I protected that from ever being out in the world. The irony is amazing. This complaint gives Megan the opportunity to brand herself as the bigger person who found it in herself to forgive Catherine for this incident, which is about as relevant as Harry and Megan's Netflix show. So once again, we see that self-branding is sensitive to Megan. It's what almost all her answers lead to eventually. However, as we've also seen, the self-branding doesn't always match her actual statement. Now, if it's okay with you, I want to have an ice cream. You should too. I really and truly think it's a hands-on experience. Granted, it's just an ice cream, but eating ice cream is a great benchmark for what all people in the world could be doing. See you next time for a video with my personal thumbprint on it.